You know, I wish they would have been. It would have turned out a lot better than games we had. <laughs> I don't even need to be up here, right? We had a wonderful message. Thank you, girls. That blessed my heart. Let's start with prayers. Father, we do thank you for your love. We thank you for each one who has accepted what you have offered through Jesus Christ. We thank you for the blood of the Lamb that was slain for us to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so that you don't see us with our filthy rags, but you see us with the righteousness of Jesus. May we bring glory and honor to you in all that we do. May we praise you for you are worthy, O Lord. Just open up our hearts, open up our minds to hear your word, to be attentive to what the Spirit calls us to do, Father, and help us to be obedient as we show our love back for you because you taught us how to love and the fact that you loved us while we were still your enemies. You sent Christ to die for us. And we thank you and praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. So an announcement that I forgot first, just so you know, on the sign-up sheets, if you have seen that passed around, food needs to be cooked. Don't bring a frozen turkey because <laughs> we won't have time to cook it. And I want to make sure I say that because every year we get a frozen turkey and we can't cook one that fast. So everything needs to be cooked so that they can just simply warm it up. They have ways to warm it up. And if you have, yes, dear? we probably will be putting stuff in the ovens down stairs to cook first. Once we see what we have, we'll see where we need to fill in the gap still. Yes, Bob? We've also warned that we're sure they're cooked well. Yeah. Yes. yes. We had a couple, we had a couple, we had a couple undercooked ones and we were able to deal with them. And also, if you have your special recipe for your grandma's corn souffle or whatever, don't be offended because if you bring that, it's just going to get pot, put in the pot with the corn because we only have X amount of serving things. Yeah, so, don't make something fancy. So if you do have something special you want to make, make it in a dessert because those will be pies cut up for people and so forth. One thing that we're doing differently also that I need to mention is we're trying to expand upon the service to the community, to our churches and, and the people. We will be doing to-go boxes. So if you know someone that's a friend, relative, shut in from church, whatever it is, we need to know those number of boxes because you can come in and get uh, a uh, take home for them and take it to them. Now, you'll be the one responsible for taking them, but we'll try to fill that need as well so that we can minister to people who aren't able to go. Is that during the whole time? Yes, you can set your time for that and everything. So if you have questions, ask Jacob. His number's on there, and I'm going to put a flyer back there. So I do want to speak briefly this morning a little bit about the Reformation. That was what we talked about a little bit last week, and if you didn't know that, 
Last week was Halloween, but it was also Reformation Day. It was the 500th anniversary of when Martin Luther tacked his thesis up on the, the door at the church. It was one man, not a saint by any means as far as he acted, but a saint in the fact that he accepted Jesus Christ, just as all of us are saints, just as all of us are priests that you've heard me say. He was a fallible man just like you or I, and that gives us the courage to stand and say that God uses infallible people, doesn't He? He uses sinners. He, does, he doesn't use people that are equipped, but I guarantee you He equips people that He calls to serve. It's such a good thing to read the Psalms. What a blessing they are. What a treasure they are to read. And they were written by an adulterer and a murderer. But he was, they were also written by a man who was after God's own heart. See, it's not about us. It's about our God. He uses us to bring Him glory and honor. And that's what we've got to remember and be obedient and know that He fills us with the power and everything. So Martin Luther is not someone that we put up on a pedestal, so to speak. He did plenty wrong. He, he hated God's own people. He, he was very adamant against, about his hatred towards the Jews. But he stood firm, and our church as we know it today is totally changed. When he tagged those 95 theses, there were 95 different points or statements written in Latin for the church to hear, not the common people, saying, here's what you're doing that I don't agree with based off this scripture. Because see, this scripture wasn't in the hands of common people. But we have it in the hands of common people today. Common people are you and I. We have it in our hands that we can read because of Calvin, because of Luther, because of their faith. And he said, here's what you're doing wrong, church. But the Catholic church didn't reform. Instead, the Protestant Reformation came out of that. What does reform mean? It's in your bulletin. It says a little bit up front. It says it's a change for the best or for the better. And I put a definition inside that says, to change, usually for the better. The act of making changes, usually for the better. And I put right under that, to let God transform. You know, the other side, to change the way you think, and it will change the way you live. Because, see, Jesus taught repentance, that change of mind so that it could affect our heart to change the way we live. That It is not about our power and our might. It's not about our sin and about our shame. It's about our God that we serve. And whether we're going to be obedient and follow in the footsteps of Christ or not as we were called to do. See, if we weren't called to do that, simply when we got saved, God would just take us home, wouldn't He? But see, we still have a job to do here on earth. To let our light shine, to tell others about Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so, I want to go over a little bit of the 95 Theses. Are you familiar with them at all? The first thesis, number one, is a statement that says, When our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ, said... Repent. He willed the entire life of the believer to be one of repentance. See, that's not a Bible verse. This is a statement that Martin Luther said to the church. But can we back that up by Scripture? It's based on Matthew 4, 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. This is the beginning of His ministry. What did He say? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I can't stress that enough because it is the process that brings you to salvation, that change of mind that I can't get to God. I can't become like Christ. I am not worthy at all. There's nothing I can do about it, but God has done it for me. I have to realize it. I have to change my way of thinking. I have to deny myself. I have to take up my cross and follow after Him so that it can affect my heart, so that it can affect my life. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. God has come to His people, Emmanuel, Christ with us, the chosen Messiah, the Son of God, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, has come to earth to make things right, to do what we could never do ourselves. So let's break down this thesis just a minute. Who said it? Jesus. Jesus who? Christ. That's not His last name, people. That's who He is. 
He is the chosen Messiah, the appointed one from God. The one that God has appointed and sent to save mankind from their sins. The way, the truth, and the life. The lamb that would be slain for the world to offer forgiveness of sin. That no one can come to the Father except through Jesus the Christ. The Old Testament word is the Messiah. And the Jews didn't recognize that as a whole, as a nation when He came. So that offered it up offered up salvation to the Gentiles. So God had a chosen nation, but now He has a chosen people. Not that He was the father of a nation, and He still, he still is, but now He's the father of us individually. That the Spirit of God resides in you, and you are the temple of God. You are His priests. Think about that. That's who you are in Christ. So what an obligation, what a privilege that you have to be that ambassador, to be that priest, to be that light to the world, to be the, to be the salt that brings preservative and flavor to this world. He's counting on you. You are called out to live in a foreign land as a delegate of God Himself, as His own child. So Jesus Christ said this, Who is Jesus Christ? When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ, not Savior, not friend, we have those names for Jesus, but our Lord and Master, that we have no rights and privileges, that we are bought with the price, the blood of Jesus Christ, to be God's possession. He created us to be His possession, to be in a relationship with Him. Why? We didn't, he didn't need us. He chose to create us. And then we rebelled and sinned, but He bought us back while we were still enemies to His very own child. We belong to God. That's why I love that song from Big Daddy Wee. We said, I belong to God. Whoa. Because I belong to God. God Almighty. God of the universe. And I can't even fathom creation. I belong to Him. So Jesus should be my Lord and my Master. I should obey His commandments. And Jesus tells us, if we love Him, we will obey His teachings. He tells us that the, the key to Scripture is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And then the second is to love your neighbor. And He tells us to love as He loved and gave up His life for them. So Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Master, said what? Repent. Repent. Could have started off any other way, but he said, you've got to change the way you think or you can never be used of God. You can never be the, all that you should be. Isn't that a, whose slogan is that, John? Is that army? Be all you can be or marine? Army, army. yeah. You can never be all you can be without changing your mind and letting God show you who you are in Him. That the power of God, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, lives inside of you. You are God's possession, God's child with a mission in this world to show and live as Jesus lived so that they can see the love of God the Father. The rest of things don't matter. That's what matters. It doesn't matter about the number of guns we have or RVs we have, but we're so blessed with that. It doesn't matter about the freedom that we have. It matters that God loves us and has called us to be His very own. So we should tell others about that. To repent. This wasn't a new thing that Jesus talked about. He was actually repeating the words of John the Baptist, the last prophet of the Old Testament that came projecting the message and the promise of the Messiah coming. We read about it in Matthew 3. Starting in verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Looks pretty close, doesn't it? No, it's word for word what Jesus said in Matthew 4, 17. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus was quoting what John already said. The message hasn't changed. The Holy Spirit gave John the message 
of Jesus, and Jesus repeated what John's word said because John was following after what God had called him to do. Verse 3, This is who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for Him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the river Jordan. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, the ones coming that should know better, coming to where he, he was baptized, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Producing fruit is something that doesn't happen overnight. It's a long process of growth, of producing a little fruit, then a little more fruit, to where you have this succulent fruit on the vine. So repentance is this, this concept that's brought about to bring salvation, but it's also a concept that the believer should have to have his whole life, that he should follow in repentance, changing. Because there's plenty of times when I don't think something's a sin, and later on God convicts me, hey, you know, you probably shouldn't be doing this. Oh yeah, change my way of thinking. Now I've got to decide whether I'm going to accept that and do that and be obedient to my Lord and Master or if I'm going to continue on with my own way of thinking and don't experience what God wants me to experience, the joy and the peace and fulfillment that He's offering. Verse 8 says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children of Abraham. Don't think of yourself more highly than ought to. Don't think that you go to church so that makes you okay. Don't think that you read your Bible and that makes you okay. Or that you pray that you, and it's okay. Change the way you're thinking. Draw yourself to Jesus for salvation and draw yourself to Him as Lord and Master as He puts His Spirit in you more and more. Jesus taught His disciples how to pray. He said, keep on asking, keep on knocking and the Lord will come to you. Keep on seeking and you will find it. Because God wants to be known. He is your Father in heaven. Verse 10, The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize with you, you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit in fire. His winnowing fork is in His hand, and He will clear His threshing floor, gather His wheat into the barn, and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So we are called to repent by Jesus, the promised Messiah, who should be our Lord and our Master, to change that way of thinking, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. God has come to His people offering salvation. We are part of that kingdom. We are to behave and act like citizens, to grow, to be like Christ. That is what our objective is, which means more and more dying to ourselves, more and more changing our way of thinking, more and more repentance. So are you building up eternal rewards? Or are you still stuck in your old way of thinking, thinking that this life matters and I need to chase after these dreams? I need to fill my storehouses, my barns, because I don't know when drought and famine are coming. Or are you going to let Jesus take care of you, you fool, because He is the one that knows when He'll require your life. And He's the one that gives you all things anyway. Look at the snow. I'm not ready for that now, but God brought it, so I praise Him for it. I cannot imagine a world where God was not in control and didn't love us. He loves us so much that so when you think, hear of disasters and rumors of war and, and terrible things in weather and everything, know that God is there, He's in control, and He cares. True repentance is this, changing the way you think so that it will forever change the way you act and live. And there will be good fruit produced in your life so that it can nourish others. Let's look at Jesus' first teaching, Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 15. Watch out for false prophets 
They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inward, inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from, bush, from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus by their fruit you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Are you seeing the significance of Jesus saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Are you going to be part of it? Are you going to be an inhabitant of it? Are you going to dwell with God forever? Or are you going to stick to your old way of thinking and think that by your righteous deeds you'll be saved? You brood of vipers, don't think that way. That's what John clearly said. Change the way you think so that you understand what God has done for you so that you can learn to love even your enemies because that's exactly what God did for you. So true repentance, I'll say it again, is to change the way you think so that it will forever change the way you act and live. So that there will be good fruit produced in your life that will nourish others. And guess what? By this fruit you will be recognized. So how is the fruit that you're producing? I'm just using Jesus' words here. Examine your own. They're not my words, they're His. What does your fruit look like? And guess what? There's always a chance to grow. Jesus tells us that, that He'll sit and pick at the roots, He'll nourish, He'll, he'll, he'll give you everything you need to, to, to have one more day to ask the Father, to ask the, the keeper of the vineyard to let this tree produce good fruit. Because that's what God's looking for in your life, that you produce that fruit in keeping with repentance. So Thesis 1 said, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent... Second part of that is he or God willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. See, it is God's will that you are sanctified, that you grow in your faith, that you become more like Christ, that you continue in repentance, that you produce good fruits your entire life. That's your purpose. That's why you're born again. So can you see the first thesis? Can you see what Martin Luther was saying? This is how he started out these 95 thoughts that he put on the church's door. He said, we need to get back to the basics to understand what God is saying, to understand His words. Peter taught this. In Acts 2, verse 36 through 39, we read, Therefore let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah, When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. So are we teaching our children more about this, to repent? Is that the biggest thing you teach them, or do you teach them more about sports? Or do you teach them more about economics? Where are your priorities? What fruit are you producing? Paul preached the same thing in Acts 26, verse 19 and 20. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds, by their actions, by their fruit. Thus Martin Luther saying the hypocrisy in the church, selling indulgences so that people's sins could be forgiven. Where is that at in the Bible? What does that say about Jesus Christ, our Lord, the gift that God gave us if a man can sell indulgences, if there is something other than Jesus to offer for salvation, if we can work our way to heaven? 
And he penned that first thesis. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. Changing the way we think. Is the church a lot better today? Or do we have messages that aren't the truth? Do we have gospel prosperity that if you believe in Jesus, He'll make everything great for you. If you're not following in His will, then that's why you suffer. <laughs> Read your epistles. You are called to suffer as Christ our Lord suffered for you. To show our love. To show the genuineness of our faith. We have some churches that teach that Jesus is a way, a truth, and will bring you life. But that's not what the Bible says, is it? So we need to stand firm in our faith. Read our Bible. Understand what we believe and teach that. One man stood firm and we have the freedoms that we have today and we have the Word in the hands of the people. This last thesis that he wrote, the 95th one, was, and thus be confident of entering into heaven through many tribulations rather than through the false security of peace. Many tribulations. That kind of blows that prosperity out, doesn't it? Acts 14, verse 21 and 22. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter what? The same thing that Jesus said why we need to repent, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. It's not easy. The Bible doesn't claim that it is. But if you love something, if you're passionate about something, won't you work hard for it? Didn't Christ suffer to save you? He could have called down a legion of angels to take Him off the cross, anything else. But what did He do? He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then He said, it is finished. There's nothing else we have to do but believe it. There is nothing else that we add to the gospel but the gospel message itself. Because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You will have hardships. In John 13, Jesus gave the example to His disciples. He washed their stinking feet, literally. In verse 14, I mean, chapter 14, He told them not to worry, that He'd be going away. And they would be staying behind because they had a job to do, a mission, a task, to follow in the footsteps of their Lord and Master, their rabbi, their teacher. And in John 14, Jesus said this. Verse 5 says, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where, where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. All three things encompass in Jesus. And no one whatsoever comes to the Father except through me. There's your gospel message. We have to stand firm on that truth. In John 15, Jesus went on to say, verse 16, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you. Appointed you to a task so that you might go and bear fruit. Are you producing that fruit? Or do you need some more cultivation? Do you need some more fertilizer so that you can produce more, so that people can nourish and live off of that fruit to eternal life? Fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. You belong to the kingdom of heaven. You are God's child. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you, a servant is no greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. 
I hope and pray that you do. And the message that you're giving bears that fruit of true repentance. The love of God for you through Jesus Christ by your loving and serving others, by giving them fruit that will last. Out of the Reformation, there are five solas or five statements that kind of sum up the Reformation. And I'd like to mention them, and I'd like for you to think about them. You can go uh, Google that if you want to, to find a little bit more, because I'm just going to briefly mention them. That, that's S-O-L-A-S is how you spell it. It's a Latin term. It just means that it's a phrase or a slogan. Sola Scriptura is the first one. Sola means alone or only. Sola Scriptura means that the Bible alone is your final authority. Not me, not someone else, not some book you read that says this or that. Merle and I were started, a, well, and the rest of the guys started a study, and the first thing the guy said is, is the millennium is a time period. Well, Peter does say and use the word says that a, a, a day is a, to a thousand years to the Lord. So that doesn't necessarily mean exactly a thousand years. It means a long period of time. So that word can mean that or it can mean a literal 1,000 years. John is the only other one that uses that word and he uses it every time in a form of measurement prior to where he says we'll serve with Jesus for 1,000 years. So I take it as a thousand years. Now I can be convinced otherwise Martin Luther was wrong, Alan Henson has been wrong before. Okay. But I'm going to Scripture to base that, not a book. So we've started debating on that, and Merle and I love to debate. <laughs> it just it goes home, and then Polly has to deal with it. <laughs> and Sherry has to deal with it. So. But Scripture is our authority. Put your nose in the Word of God. Seek Him. Tell Him what you want to know. And your Father will show you the kingdom. The second one is sola fide, or faith alone. We're saved by faith alone, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but by our faith. It's the same in the Old Testament. Hebrews 11 clearly states that. By faith Abraham, by faith Noah, by faith Isaac. They hadn't seen Jesus Christ come yet, but they had faith that God would save them through the promised Messiah. They don't have to know how. I don't know how when I turn on the light switch, everything about the electricity, the light comes on, but I have faith that if there's power, and the power comes from God in our lives and for salvation, that when we flip the switch, the lights will come on. And when I flip the switch of faith, I know that I am saved. I don't have to do anything else, but I'm still breathing, so I have an obligation. I'm still being loved by Him, still being supplied everything that I need, and even then more. And Jesus' love has cleansed me. His blood has cleansed me from all unrighteousness. So I should act upon that faith. But faith is the saving factor. By faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Sola gratia it means grace alone. Saved by God's grace. You are His enemy. You deserve hell and damnation. You disobey God Almighty. But instead He said, I want you to come home. I want you to be my own child. That's how much I love you. Grace that we never deserved. And He continues to pour out grace upon grace upon grace to His children because we are His children and nothing can separate us from His love. Solus Christus means Christ alone. Jesus alone is our Lord, our Savior, and our King. There's no other name under heaven given to men whereby you might be saved. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that was slain for the world. And the last one is sola, Soli Deo Gloria. Now think about this one. Because this should be your life's motto. To the glory of God alone. Everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that you say, as a child of God, as someone who belongs to the kingdom, as you are repenting and thinking of this process, should be for the glory of God. He created you. He chose to create you. You exist and have your being because He willed it. 
And then when you betrayed Him, when you sinned against Him, when you spit in His face, and the face of His Son and nailed His Son to the tree, He still loved you to the glory of God that He is so good, so merciful, so loving. He provided the way for us. He takes care of us. He'll give us a home for all eternity without sin, without shame, without tears, without regret. All because of who He is. To God be the glory alone. So repent. If you're a viper, <laughs> if you're a saint, repent and come to God. He will change your way of thinking. He will change your heart so that you can produce fruit. So that you can build up treasures in heaven. So that you can have an impact. Not be a stumbling block, but present the stumbling block of Jesus Christ to others. That We don't stand in the way of the gospel message. Repent and come to Him. We should be so thankful that He loves us. So will you be obedient and give God the glory in your life? Will you let Him fill you with His Spirit? Will you let Him give you peace and joy like you could never, ever even imagine till we all get home and spend eternity with Him? Father, we do thank You so much for who You are. We thank You for the examples of men of faith who were fallible, tarnished sinners that you use to bring about your glory and your might. We thank you for your church. Lord, may we stand firm to the truths that the church of Jesus Christ should have. That we are a body of believers brought together with Jesus as our head. Help us to be obedient and carry out the will and, and of you, Father, and follow in the footsteps and teachings of Jesus. Thank you for this church. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the love and the unity that we have here. Thank you for the, your humble servants. And Lord, just give us more of you so that we can be more like Jesus to the world. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.